What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. I'm Ron, and today we have a Dynasty Superflex rookie mock post combine. We have a special guest, Jacob Sanderson. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing great. I mean, is there anything more fun on earth, frankly, than a mock draft? It's mock draft season. Uh, anything to get my mind off of the Leafs just trading all of our remaining draft picks for absolute pylons. Um, as I have a complete and utter meltdown on X.com. Yeah, and I'm sure I'm sure you guys will figure it out in the playoffs. I know you guys always do. Um, wow. Wow. <laughs> you invite me on your show. I What's mean, the I'm shortest a podcast fan. you've ever recorded? What's the shortest yeah. guest appearance you've ever recorded? Because I'm about to leave after 49 seconds after fixing this abuse. No, of course, of course. Well, I have Jacob on. I respect him a ton. We haven't really compared notes on this rookie class yet, so I think it'll be interesting to have him on. We might do this regularly where every couple of weeks I bring somebody on, we do a rookie mock just to kind of talk through the players. I know I debated doing, like, landing spots and, like, a mock draft, but it's so far out that I don't even really want to, like, move players up or down based on, like, fake draft capital. So we're just going to talk through the pure prospects here. Now, first up, I'll put you on the clock. I'll be a I'll be a gentleman. I'll let my host go first. Who do you want? Again, this is going to be Dynasty Superflex, 0.5 tight end premium rookie mock here. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, and then there's no crazy trading, right? We're just are we snaking this? Like I got one, four, five, or are we rotating? How we'll how just we we'll just this? rotate. We'll just go back to back, we'll like one, rotate. two, yeah. Okay, um, and we're not putting any picks on the block. We're just we're just wrapping. No, we're just going straight up. <laughs> Your best guys versus my best guys. Okay, so super flex draft. I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm just gonna be boring, uh, and I'm gonna pick Caleb Williams. Oh, of uh, course. I, yeah. Uh, look, it seems it feels like maybe some of the shine is slightly off of Caleb Williams compared to how people thought about him this time last year and how people kind of conceived of the 101. But I'm still a big believer. I still think he has pretty special. Ability, I think he grades out really well. Uh, when I watch him, he grades out exceptionally well by the data. Um, I think he is still the clear cut QB one in this class, and the NFL seems to view him as such. And as much as I do like the wide receivers and think they're really strong bets, just the upside of a value of a quarterback and super flex is is higher. Um, and you get that security, you know, even if, even a Trevor Lawrence who, and for the record, I still very much believe in Trevor Lawrence, but even a Trevor Lawrence who, to some failed to meet expectations you're still looking at like a round two startup pick after three years of his career so you have to be pretty um epically disappointing when you're this heralded of a prospect where first overall to not be a value so Caleb. yeah exactly I, and i was gonna say i i was reading up on uh game counter he put out a thread on some of the top picks on his discord and he has caleb williams like over trevor lawrence as a prospect i don't think that i'm that like it's, i don't think there. Yeah, you would put him for dynasty purposes or just like altogether you'd have him over Lawrence as like a prospect? Yeah, I think that that's fair. I don't know that I have like a massive opinion about that. Um, I think it's it's clearly to me those are the top two guys. And they've, they're almost similar in the sense that they like peaked epically high early and then had maybe not quite as dynamic of a year to follow that. Um, pro- probably the thing that pushes it to me with Caleb a little bit is just you know, I, I think that his, I, I like his ball placement and accuracy a little bit better. Um, my main concern with him maybe is just that he doesn't necessarily stay in the structure of the play as frequently, but that's just, I guess, not as big of a concern. I think he is more consistently accurate than Lawrence. Um, and I would also say he had like virtually no skill position help compared to what Trevor Lawrence had at Clemson. I'm not, I'm, especially in his last year, Trevor Lawrence didn't have like the monsters out there. But I, Amari I think, Rogers. Uh, yeah, better a little earlier in his career. It's a pretty solid dude. You know, oh, I yeah. get the exact timeline of everything of when he had Renfro or when he had whomever. Um, but yeah, I, I like, uh, I'm good with Caleb being best thought of since Locke. I think that's like reasonable enough. But if you like Lawrence more, I wouldn't fault you for that either. Yeah, I, I'd probably lean Lawrence, but I, I agree that it's a conversation just because like Lawrence 6'6, I feel like he could have been a first overall pick the day that he declared for Clemson, just like out of high school, just how much hype he had coming out. Um, and being kind of like a more prototypical type quarterback that plays within structure. But um, I do get it. Caleb is very fun. Like he had that one. Uh, I know that you watch film much more than me. I love the uh, the quarterback school, JT O'Sullivan. And he had this. Oh, one yeah. Play. Guy's the goat. No, he's amazing, dude. Like I'll 
I'll put it on like like I'll I'll go to sleep and I'll put it on like two X and just like you know he'll break it all down. Um, and he had one where he like spun. It might have been Washington or Oregon or something, but he like spun yeah. somebody out in the open field. It was just like a silly looking spin move. That yeah, that was no the last quarterback game. should do. That was yeah. one of the that was one of the games that I got to watch its entirety live, and it was too bad that the second half kind of got away from them, where their defense just sucked, and he had the one subble before half time. But yeah, that one drive was like the silliest drive I've ever seen. Like that was a, he had that ridiculous spin out, and that was the same drive that they had the fourth and one where it was like totally clobbered in the backfield, and he spun out of it and just like hucked it to the left uh, uh, left goalpost. And just threw an absolute dive. It was, it was a totally insane drive. Yeah, just, he's insane. Yeah. And a big caveat with a lot of his stuff is because you have a lot of these film guys looking back at his tape from like only his final year, which is like I think one of the biggest flaws with some people's evaluations. You have to remember this USC team. The offensive line was garbage. The surrounding cast was garbage. He had to put up like forty to even you know stay above water in these games. So yes, he's mm. playing hero ball, but he kind of has to. Now it's my pick here, number two overall. The quarterbacks are enticing. Um. But I'm going to go Marvin Harrison Jr. He is the prince who was promised. He is the son of a Hall of Famer. Absolute stud. Best prospect that we've seen since uh, Jamar Chase at this point. Like, I I could hear the argument for positional value with the quarterbacks, but I am curious how you feel about this from, like, a dynasty, like, almost, like, meta perspective. It's Marvin Harrison Jr. Like, how bad would he have to be in year one to, like, truly lose, you know, like, top 25 startup pick value? Yeah, I mean, so this top 25 startup is probably pretty bad because yeah. JSN wasn't even as considered as highly as a prospect with MHJ, and he was pretty shitty as a rookie, and people, people drafted him care. in the top 25 uh, of wide receivers. But I think, you know, there's certainly, I think, a, still a lower floor on a wide receiver than there is on a quarterback from a poor year one. Um, my attitude about it is, is like, I'm, I'm kind of very unsure how I'm going to approach this two through five zone because normally if there was sort of one guy that I was just totally fine missing out on, on, that would make my life a lot easier. But I really like all these guys and it's going to be hard for me to put myself in a position where I wind up just drafting none of any one of them. Cause I think that they're all really high probability to hit. So I'm, I'm not like settled that I think Harrison should be the second pick. It seems very likely that's what's going to happen in most drafts. And I don't, I certainly don't think that I have like any intention of putting myself intentionally like way underweight the field on Marvin Harris, which is what would happen if you don't pick him too. So that's probably the pick I would go with. Yeah, I think that's a a smart way to approach it. But I've been saying like it's funny how like we're both victims to it, but it's very important. Like, of course, you want to either be top dominating or you want to be tanking. But this is kind of a funny year where like if you just miss the playoffs, you're probably like as long as you weren't the, the 106, like 102 through 105 are pretty golden regardless, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, yeah, you're up next at the three spot. Marvin Harrison Jr. off the board, Caleb Williams. Uh, I'm curious where you go here. Yeah, this is a, this is a hard one. Um, and it, it, I'm really torn between a few guys here because, I, I again, I, I think there's sort of a mix. I think there's one here that's like the ultimate upside swing. There's one that I feel really, really safe and cozy about. It's going to be a total stud. And then one guy maybe a little bit more in between those two. But ultimately, like I'm I'm ultimately at the end of the day, I'm boring and I default to the quarterback value and super flex. And I'm going with the guy that I, I think is the clear cut second best prospect in the class for thinking from a dynasty lens. So I'm going with Drake May. I love it. Now why why Drake May over Jaden Daniels for you? Yeah, that's just purely a just a, a a more confidence in, I mean, I, I guess the floor, really the the talent where, you know, Drake May, I think is going to be an underrated rusher. I think he's going to be, frankly, probably more of a goal line rushing threat than Jaden Daniels because he has a, a massive size advantage. Uh, I don't imagine he's going to become anywhere near the rusher between the 20s or anywhere near the explosive rusher that Jaden Daniels is. But I don't think that the rushing gap, when you factor in, you know, how important a red zone rushing role is, is going to be so massive for me to overtake what I think is, is a vastly superior prospect profile. And I know that, you know, a lot of people don't agree with that statement, especially according to the, the reports, even some NFL teams are, are looking at potentially Daniels first. 
I, I don't think it's close. I mean, Jane Daniels, and I love Jane Daniels. I've been like one of the few Jane Daniels believers for years in the Debbie streets, um, holding a candle out. I mean, he was impressive year one in Arizona State. He was downright bad for two years afterwards. Pops in 2022. And now people are doing this revisionist history thing. Some of the draft people, oh, you can't just look at his 2023. He was great since 2022. Okay. Go back to last August and find whatever draft articles you want to find about Jaden Daniels if he was turned a corner in 2022. Because you'll find some articles saying he might sneak into day three and some saying he'd be a day two consideration if he converted to wide receiver. So save me the we've all known he was this good since 2022 because it's crap. Uh, he was better in 2022, meaningfully so, such that I thought he was a pretty interesting speculative investment in Debbie. But in terms of when he became a legitimate round one NFL pick consideration, it was mid three through his fifth year, and reasonably so, because he was bad for most of his college career before that. So to me, you know, it's, it's, it's more of an Anthony Richardson bet than I think the community is seeing. I understand that the raw production looks a lot better because he has a great fifth year, but we're talking about you know, a backloaded profile. It took a long time to put it together. I think he has legitimate weaknesses in terms of reading defenses, in terms of avoiding sacks. And I see him as a very high ceiling bat because he's a great deep thrower and he's very, uh, absolutely electric, elite runner. But I, I see it as more of a risk reward swing um, compared to May and to, you know, the other position player that probably goes around here. So I, I just think it's a little bit too much for me to gamble versus May, who has been a stud. Since recruiting, he was a stud in year two. He's only had three years, two years younger than Daniels, a full year younger than Caleb Williams. Um, succeed in fantasy-friendly ways himself, right? He runs the ball effectively. He has goal line ability as a rusher. And he especially succeeds on deep throws, right? Deep intermediate and deep passing, which is what we want to see out of fantasy. So I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of him. Yeah, I like May too. I, I've been back and forth myself because I think this has been kind of one of the themes of this offseason for me. It's kind of reflecting on maybe like where I would have stood in 2020. Um, and I'm sure you're similar where we loved Anthony Richardson because of the rushing upside, right? Like we're not scared to push up these types of profiles, but at a certain point, you can't just focus in on like what this guy can be as a rusher. It's tough. Like he had a, fr a good freshman year at Arizona State or like, a, you know, the beginning of yep. his career and then just like nothing happened. And then he looked good, but he also has, you know, two first round wide receivers. He's super thin. He's like maybe 6'4", 205, like. I, I was watching the QB school as well. And like, there were numerous times where like there would be a guy like wide open and he would just like take off. And that's, that's cool. You know, that's going to happen in the NFL, but at the same time, it, it, he's not, you know, a more normal quarterback. And I think the thing with may is like, like you said, the rushing upside is there. The thing that's curious about him is I don't see him being like, we've seen this with like Baker Mayfield and Johnny Manziel, like, you know, the white quarterback that ran in college and it didn't convert. He seems much more like your Josh Allen where he's like big as hell uh athletic like family his brother was luke may at unc and i, mm -hmm. I feel like you know his athleticism will actually shout translate hey yeah shout out luke may um now this is me on the board i believe at the yeah. four spot uh, i say all of that about Jaden daniels to say i'm gonna take him here i really like the guy that you know it's but down to the two of them but they're so close to me that I'd rather go with the quarterback. Like we saw in the Richardson, I guess he, he played in four games and is a top 15 startup pick, like rightfully so. Not that that's like a, you know, a knock on him or anything. But Daniels to me, as long as he shows that he can be a monster producer. I mean, we saw with Fields as well, where Fields held like first round startup or, you know, top 16 startup pick value early in his career. It just feels like a pretty good bet to make. Um, and I will say one thing on the uh, May part that I wanted to, to point out is like with the deep throwing. Uh, he had 69 big time throws to nine turn worthy plays on nice. throws of 20 or more yards. Yeah, nice. Uh, and Jaden Daniels over his like five year career had 64 big time throws to six turn worthy plays on 20 plus yard throws. Like May is airing that shit out um, over that two year span. Daniels can do it as well, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not as sexy uh, from Daniels, I guess, or as often. Now. You're doing Daniels there. I'm pumped. I'm running to the podium. I'm sprinting to the podium. Uh, Malik Neighbors, who I'm, I'm like, I'm just kind of averse to hot having generally, mostly because even when I have hot personally, it becomes kind of pointless because unless I'm willing to just take zero of someone, I don't always mention that in the market. But you can count me in the Neighbors Curious column in terms of 
is Marvin Harrison Jr. actually the wide receiver one in this class? Um, I, I think Neighbors is phenomenal. Production profile is off the charts. Uh, absolutely elite across the board. Yards between pass down, yards per route run. Early breakout. Has done it next to multiple different NFL wide receivers, including a very likely round one wide receiver this year. Is, in my opinion, plausibly responsible for the resuscitation of Jaden Daniels from Lazarus Pitt into round one NFL quarterback. And I, I would venture as far as to say that basically if you go from the Amari Cooper draft year until this year, this might be the only year he's not the number one receiver taken. It'd be, and maybe Jamar Chase. Um, that would be as, where, I, where I would go. So I think this is truly... A, a a treat to be able to draft Malik neighbors in this class as far back as the one five, which might happen fairly frequently. Um, and I, I hope that, you know, I think we've kind of caught on now, but I don't think that how good of a prospect Marvin Harrison is should dampen how incredibly sought after Malik neighbors would be in any other class. I think he's a top 12 dynasty wide receiver right out of the gate um, and absolute total stud. Yeah, I agree. It's it, Malik neighbors is absolutely bonkers. Like he, I think uh, Ian had a tweet about this earlier, but like I, I agree that like, he's probably the best wide receiver two in a class since AJ Green in terms of just you know having the top guy, the next guy get drafted. Malik Neighbors is a stud. He's not even going to turn forget, twenty-one. AJ Green July. was the first wide receiver drafted in that. Oh, class. Julio, was, Julio the second. was the second. Yeah, that's true. But it feels like exactly the same, where it's just like two studs. Any discount on that's like you know like and I'm a bit hypocritical as I took Marvin Harrison Jr. ahead of the two quarterbacks, but. Any value you're getting on neighbors in comparison to Harrison Jr. is probably a good value, whether that's dynasty, redraft. He's going way, not way after, but, you know, sizable margin after Marvin Harrison Jr. in pretty much all formats. Now, back to me, I have a little bit of a tough decision where I think that there's clearly two players here. Um, but I am going to go, man, it is absolutely tough when they put you under the barrel like this. But I think I'm going to go Roma Dunze, man. I really do. And like I said earlier, with the idea of growth and looking back on previous misses, I, I, think, I, I think 2020 me would have pulled up top 10 picks who weren't early declare, and I would have pointed Kevin White, Tavon Austin. I would have pointed out, you know, the, the entire list of, of guys who didn't work out, you know, uh, Corey Davis, Mike Williams. But I just think we're in a new age at this point. I also I'm curious what your thoughts are, because I was talking with uh, Corey Bushland and Danny earlier this week. I don't know that like the, the whole idea of the analytics community and stuff like, you know, we're a part of it is it, it seems like some of the model making or modeling is geared towards finding the next Kevin White. And I just don't know that that's ever going to be. I, I don't know that as the NFL progresses, I don't know that there's going to be another wide receiver taken top 10. That's like very clearly holy shit, like that's an awful pick uh, for the NFL. Right. I mean, that's the thing, right? If, if the end, it's kind of the same thing as fantasy <clears throat> market, right? You know, we used to talk about the running back dead zone and it was this proxy variable thing of like, well, you shouldn't draft running backs between here. And we all knew it wasn't some magical spell that if a running back gets drafted in a certain area, they're bad. It's, it's, we have without knowledge, you know, of this sort of trend, been drafting the same type of flawed running back in this zone and you get some of the same idea with the nfl like the nfl has gotten more into analytics recently they, they have started to i think take more prospects earlier that wouldn't have gone as early in the past and and vice versa in terms of the you know the kevin whites of the world and i'm not saying that's universal but i do think that the analytic community the nfl has converged a little bit and so when that happens you're getting some of these better prospects um, that might have might look a little bit like outliers of the past, but maybe aren't. Um, I, I have no issue with the Dunes. I uh, think I'm probably one spot behind where he goes here, but I, I feel pretty great about him. I mean, in the day, super productive. Two point what was it two point nine eight yards per route run this year, I believe, and two point five two as a junior. So it's not like he waited till senior year to break out or anything like that. And that's probably two other day two picks beside him in a really spread out, you know, high octane through the air offense where he's still able to put up elite efficiency and consolidate a reasonable amount of volume. All the NFL scouts say he's going to be a top 10 pick. Um, 
you know, I, I think in terms of like the senior declare stuff and the later breakout stuff, like to me, that's a reason why I still don't see it as like a, as him being in the tier with neighbors and Harrison. Like if you're giving me other prospects, the NFL is telling me that are worth top five, top 10 draft capital and they have super clean analytical profiles. I'm just going to take them. But once those guys are off the board, then I'm, I'm totally happy to take uh, Roma Dunze. And, you know, I have every reason to think he's going to be a stud. Yeah, I'm in that same camp. I will say as well, just to add, he, it, the interesting part with him is it, we've kind of seen uh, age adjusting kind of fall to the wayside. Like I can't even pull up 2024 prospects on uh, DLF for their market share by age. Maybe there's a different website that I don't know that has it. Um, but he is going to be 21 on draft day, same age as Marvin Harrison Jr., Brian Thomas, Adani Mitchell. Like, he's a very young senior. For anybody out there that is uh, a senior snob, he's also, you know, we've had these classes where last year, like all of them were, you know, Jordan Addison, Buck 70s, A Flowers is like 5'10. Roma Dunze, 6'2, 2'12, runs a 4'4'5. Four, four, um, I'm interested. Now, you're up here at the seven spot. Uh, I have a pretty good idea of what yeah, you're going to do easy here. Easy pick. What do you yeah, think? This is the easiest pick. <laughs> One seven's easiest pick in the draft, I think. Like, to me, yeah. there's a clear seven guys. I think really, really, I think what we'll see in most drafts is it's a clear five and, you know, maybe even a clear two. I, well, we'll probably see Mayor Daniels go two sometimes. So I think it's kind of a clear five and then it's a clear two in some order. Uh, and then everything goes totally off the rails. But I'll think Bowers. Um, he would be my one six in this draft for what it's worth. Uh, just, you know, tight end scarcity is still a massive benefit in dynasty. Although maybe last so we got some good young tight ends now across the landscape, but tight end production is still really valuable, especially when we're talking about a 25 premium league. And the hope with Bowers is first of all, just like straight up has just a better profile to pits. If people are, are scared of pits. I also think it's like a little bit ironic that we, we come off of this season of elite young tight end production, right? We got Laporta, we got Bride breaking up <clears> a big <throat> way in year two. We got King Hayda having a really strong rookie season. And with Bowers, pe- you know, people remember the, the hype around Pitts and that's sort of where they go. It's like, oh, remember Kyle Pitts? Well, it's, you'd also say, remember the rookie tight ends we just saw that were studs, you know, including Kyle Pitts, <laughs> frankly, uh, as a sign that maybe actually on the whole, we're getting younger, better production of tight ends recently. And I'd also say for him compared to Pitts that, you know, probably going to be drafted in a better situation. Probably not going to tear his knee to shreds in his second year. And even besides all of those reasons why I still think Pitts can and will succeed, beyond all that, I would say with respect to Bowers, his production profile is better and specifically blocked better. And he also is a little bit more used in the shorter areas of the field. I think that's been the problem with Pitts is he doesn't get the cheat tight end stuff because he's kind of virtually a receiver that he doesn't get those garbage check down targets that you'll see some of the other tight ends get. And you sort of wonder why can't he put up that production these guys do? And it's because he's not as much used in line. Bowers, very small, but Greed's out as a much better run blocker. In theory, he's more of a traditional tight end plus. And so you, you can get more of like that Kittle Kelsey type of usage instead of just being out there hanging out playing X receiver. Yeah, and I'm a sucker for guys who are dynamic uh, in the run game and the return game. Brock Bowers had 19 carries, 193 rushing yards, and five rushing touchdowns as a tight end. Like that's he's essentially like a running back hybrid tight end. Like he is a monster. I think that's what what it's going to come down to is how high he gets drafted. I think there is some merit. I know Dale Jeremiah was talking about it that like the cap hit for a top 10 pick at tight end isn't. You know, you're not getting the same surplus value there. So he could slip to like, you know, 16, 17, which would hurt his like top 10 potential profile. But then he could go to a spot like the Bengals, which is like really fun. So Bowers, really clean tight end prospect. I think that there is like fatigue from Pitts um, that's like sort of pushing him down. But he's a very fun bet to make. Now, this is kind of where, you know, shit hits the fan with this class in terms of where you want to go here. And I don't even really like this guy. I just think he's going to get drafted highly. So I'm going to go uh, J.J. McCarthy here. Uh, yeah, there you go. I, I'm not all that thrilled. Uh, he kind of – I know uh, quarterback school has been comp- – or not comping him, but – and I think I heard it on uh, – I know Karain did it with uh, Maddock the other day where they talked post-combine, where he kind of looks like Brock Purdy. I would say that that's like kind of, kind of where I lean, where he doesn't really look like he's going yeah. to have this massive ceiling. I'm curious kind of – 
where are you at on McCarthy? Like, are you excited to take him at 108? Like, what, what do you think? Yeah, I am excited to take him at 108. Um, you know, I, I don't know how high an NFL ceiling he has, but I think Purdy's in the cards. I've said before, I think he can be like Jared Goff with a little bit of mobility, which basically is Brock Purdy, I guess. Um, I think he makes the throws that NFL teams require their quarterbacks to make within the context of these Shanahan McVay offenses, right? Which is, we basically see two types of offense be successful in the NFL these days. There's the ones with the transcendent quarterback that can actually pilot a comprehensive dropback oh, game. On, Maybe three types. Then there's the uber mobile quarterbacks, you know, that can bring that element. And then we see these caretaker quarterbacks that are able to throw with anticipation over the middle with appropriate velocity and timing and accuracy and are able to orchestrate this play action based offense with a lot of over routes, a lot of slant routes, a lot of dig routes, make a throw if necessary to make the trains run on time. And I think McCarthy is a pretty plug and play option in that regard. So I think he'll have a long NFL career. Uh, I think he has the tools to succeed, whether that results in a lot of finishes above the high end QB two, low end QB one range. I'm more skeptical, but he does bring in mobility uh, in play. I think that's a little bit underrated. So I'm uh, I'm in on McCarthy at the 1-8. I think you're getting a nice, safe bet to appreciate in Dynasty value. Yeah, I agree. And, like, to give him his flowers a little bit, 14.3% pressure to sack rate is, like, one of the – I think it's Knicks and Penix are the only ones that have a better one than that. Um, and then also, like, if you wanted to key in on – like, if you were truly a, the J.J. McCarthy guy, uh, his age 20 QBR is, like, really solid, which I – it's one of the biggest inputs in, like, most quarterback models. It's Tua, Fields, Bradford, Stroud, Mariota, Pat White. Shout out to Pat White. Then McCarthy, then Bryce Young, Trevor Lawrence, Deshaun Watson. So it's like a pretty good list to be in there with. I think it's more of an efficiency metric than anything else. Um, so, I mean, is his offense sort of tied into that? Who knows? Now, the ninth pick, you're up. I'm actually very curious to know which way you go here. Uh, what do you got? Yeah, this is where things totally open up. Um, for me here, I'm going to go with Brian Thomas Jr., um, I think it's, you know, there's kind of a lot of wide receivers you could pick to be your wide receiver for in this class that I wouldn't begrudge you for. For me, it's Thomas. Uh, you know, pretty clean profile in terms of highly productive season, early breakout, has all the size you want, all the athleticism you could possibly desire. Main issue is he is a one-year wonder, right? And it comes this year and it always makes you a little bit nervous when you have this offense, which everybody all of a sudden becomes a superstar overnight because you feel like one guy He's stirring the drink, and one guy's the ice cube. And Brian Thomas is probably a leading candidate to be the ice cube in that situation, if there is one. But I, I still think he has a really nice set of skills in that he has the ability to separate deep, and he has the ability to win the ball deep. And beyond that, I think he has just enough twitch in his game where he's going to be able to run double moves, he's going to be able to run comebacks, he's going to be able to run hinges. I don't think he's purely like a guy who just has to do jump balls and nine routes all game. I don't know if he's going to be a technician necessarily, but I think in terms of archetype of these throwback X receivers, I think he has enough twitch to him that maybe we're seeing a little bit more of a T Higgins, maybe like a George Pickens plus not getting boxed out into that Corey Davis, Devontae Parker mold. At least that's my hope for him. Yeah, I, I that's sort of similar thoughts to what, what I feel about Brian Thomas or what I was going to ask you. And it seems like you're kind of in a similar boat where I was looking at his numbers and I hear a lot of those comps of like Martavis Bryan and guys who like purely win down fields and like contested catch situations. I was surprised to see he has a 22.83% missed tackles force per reception, like as a proxy. I think Martavis Bryan during his career was like 15%. So he seems like he has some wiggle. Uh, 5.3 yak perception like isn't bad either. So it seems like he could be, he could kind of develop into, you know, like a, a T Higgins, like a more, you know, total package of wide receiver. So that's interesting. I do have, you know, some flashbacks to like Terrace Marshall with a guy like this, where you know he's a part of the. Oh, oh God! Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> he's don't a part of the big time okay. offense, but Terrace Marshall's a little bit more gimmicky. Where I think that he had a bigger slot percentage, and then also a higher percent of his targets were contested, so he wasn't like getting open. Brian Thomas, at least, is like at 20 percent contested target percentage. So that's not like your, you know, I think Quentin Johnson was like thirty percent last year. Uh, but yeah, Brian Thomas Jr. Like for me. I don't know if you feel the same way, but he's like very much, he's like my locked and loaded wide receiver for like almost a stop gap between like Odunes and the rest or Odunze and the rest. Um, where it's going to take something, it's going to take a, a pretty sexy landing spot for me to move off of that. Yeah. The problem is Brian Thomas is not going to have a good landing spot because he is being drafted by the Indianapolis Colts. That's, you can yeah. write that in the 
So it wouldn't shock me at all if he went in top if, twenty. So that's like, like, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm deadly serious about this. Uh, everything the Ballard's been saying at the combine and since the end of the season indicates that they want to add a receiver. If you just kind of do the math, like they have a slot wide receiver they really like in Downs. They have an intermediate possession receiver they really like in Pittman, and really the only spot that you upgrade there is the Alec Pierce spot. So they're looking at that downfield field stretcher type. And to me, that's Thomas if they're targeting someone in round one. And by all accounts, that is kind of where they're looking in round one. So I think it's very likely, unless Bowers lasts to us, that we do go with Brian Thomas. And I love that as a Colts fan. But that all of a sudden becomes a pretty heinous fantasy situation yeah. if we're dealing with Pittman, Downs, and Thomas, all with the rushing Anthony Richardson. It's getting a little bit Eaglesy. Um, all of a sudden, except with an extra guy and, you know, a lot of, a lot of reasonable questions about Anthony Richardson's ability to create production for his pass catchers. So, uh, yeah, that part scary, but, uh, the profile, like Brian Thomas, who are you going? Yeah. Now at 10 here, I mean, this one is tough. There's like a, there's like a eight wide receiver tier of like guys that don't really stick out. This one could burn me because we're doing this so far out, but I'm going to go Bo Nix. I think he could get drafted top 15, top wow, 12. I, there you go. I think that Bo we are, Nicks. I think that they are that quarterback thirsty in the NFL. I think he could be a Bronco. He could be a Raider. I like Bo Nix. I know that that's like a, a pretty crazy thing to say. Pressure to sack rates low. His big time throw to turnworthy play rate, like at the end of his career, was great. I know that he has a lot of checkdowns and he's like an older prospect, but to me, he seems like, you know, he, he's, he's similar to J.J. McCarthy. I don't know that he's ever going to be like a, you know, a world-beating quarterback. He also a uh, pretty good rushing threat as well where he has some scrambles. I want to say uh, in his career here, yeah, he had – Bo Nix had 38 rushing touchdowns in his career, in case if you were curious. Holy shit. Um, so, I mean, like, there's stuff to like, and if he was to get drafted, you know, high enough that he could possibly start in year one, um, quarterbacks are king. I like Bo Nix. That's, that's what I'll say. Yeah, I mean, swing for the fences, right? Uh, yeah. I'll say your draft management was a little poor. I don't think I was drafting <laughs> Bo Nix anytime soon. The five quarterback. But, uh, but look, I, I mean, I can't, I can't really argue with it now because that, that pick's either going to look really, really great or, or potentially really bad depending on when he goes. But you are right. There's, there's teams that potentially need quarterback services. I think it's probably pretty likely he goes in the maybe the trade up to the late one or I think more likely in the early second. And I don't mind Bo Nix. I like him more than uh, Penix, for sure. I, you know, kind of like the similar concerns to Daniels. It's just, it's just he spent a lot of his college career being terrible. But what we saw at Oregon was really impressive. And, you know, that, that's definitely worth something. So now I'm back on the board and I got to figure out here what I'm going to do. Now we're really tricky because now we're playing a little bit of the draft capital game if I want to consider any of the running backs. Otherwise, looking at the wide receivers, did we take here? And I think for me, the guy that I'll go with here, um, you know, maybe a slightly boring pick, but if I'm confident in, you know, the production profile, this guy brought it at the combine, I think hopefully secured his draft capital. I'll, I'll go with Xavier Worthy. Wow. How do we feel about Xavier oh. Worthy? Well, until this combine, I was feeling kind of bad about him. That's all your tweet. That, you know, I just, there, there's always a guy every year, usually set of multiple guys that the fantasy community really likes. And then the, and then you start finding out around this time of year, the NFL doesn't like him as much as you do. And there's always a contingent of the analytics community. That's like, Oh man, like, I don't know why everybody's so down on this guy. Like the NFL's bunch of dummies. And it's like, no, that never works. Like that the whole analytical project to the extent that it's successful only works after the NFL has already filtered out the ones that we don't. Right. So all we're doing with analytical profiling until the NFL drafts, figuring out contingent on the NFL liking this guy, who do we think has a high chance to succeed? And, you know, we've seen it with guys like Sean Tucker, or Tyler Johnson's, your David Bells, et cetera. Jamar Jefferson. We fall in love with these guys. The NFL tells us no, and then we chase them. Fine. And I thought the worthy had a risk of being that guy because he comes in so small. And I was seeing him rank, you know, often around two, even around three in mock drafts. But the 4-2-1, like, do I really care that he ran a 4-2-1? Not really. I knew he was fast. 
But you break the combine record. Now we're talking draft capital, right? Like at this point, it'd be pretty stunning if he didn't go at least in early round two. So, uh, you know, the NFL's drafted far lesser prospects um, on the basis of a 4-2 speed in round one. So at this point, I'm, I'm back in. Uh, if the NFL doesn't draft him as highly as I suspect, then maybe he'll be back out. But at this point, I'm more willing to presume uh, good things for him. I think Jetpack Galileo said this on Twitter, and I really liked it. He was saying Xavier Worthy could go as high as number nine to the Bears because we we've seen with Velas Jones that like their their you know prospect model is like essentially just the NFL Combine. So I I am the same way where of course athleticism for wide receivers you can run the regression and it's like damn near a negative correlation. It doesn't matter at all, but it gives you draft capital. So it's like kind of a paradox in that way until we get to the the actual draft that Xavier Worthy is going to get drafted top 50 pick at the absolute worst like I, I do think that he is almost a lock to go first round he's fun he gives me some Henry Ruggs and some Jamison Williams and some John Ross vibes but none of those guys produced like Xavier Worthy did in year one and then you know probably 80 percent of that in year three Xavier Worthy is super fun um I don't really know how we, I, I am curious I, I do want to pick your brain about Xavier Worthy for a second here have you watched him a ton? I've heard that like he drops balls. And then I've also heard that he uh, isn't just a field stretcher, but he can kind of be dynamic, like as a, uh, I don't know what you want to say, like in the screen game, like how does he kind of project like it, uh, maybe not even a comp, but just what do you see him at like in the NFL? Yeah, I haven't watched a ton of him. Um, you know, like most of my like hardcore film analysis is really devoted to the running backs. And then thanks to quarterback school, <laughs> I've watched <laughs> more quarterbacks this year than I think I ever have. So my knowledge of watching the wide receivers play is predominantly at this point based off YouTube highlights or just guys who played on teams that I watched a lot. And so I'm I'm blessed that I had a Jaden Daniels, Brian Thomas stack in my C to C league, which means that I watched almost every LSU game. So I'm I'm Hmm. a lot more familiar with watching Thomas and neighbors play to play than I am Xavier Worthy, because I'm just going to be honest, I probably watched like two Texas games this year. So, uh, you know, what I've seen, at least, and this is predominantly from a clips perspective, is I think he's obviously has speed to win deep, and I think he definitely is used, going to be used around the line of scrimmage. Um, you know, the question really is with a guy of this size, is like, can he actually play outside? And a lot of draft capital answers that to some extent because teams will just force him to. But are you Rondale Moore, Wandale Robinson, where you're just destined to be in the slot forever? Or can you threaten outside? And the hope is, is that with the 4 one speed, they look at that and say, okay, this guy is such a special downfield player that we want to scheme up free releases for him as a flanker. And he's not just going to be stationed as a slot receiver. And then we get a nice little combination of, okay, three wide receiver sets. He's in the slot. He's getting yak opportunities. He's getting screens. He's getting schemed open on drag routes, et cetera. And he's staying on the field in two wide sets so they can scheme up, you know, big posts and go routes for him out of play action sets. That's the dream. And I think the higher he's drafted, the more likely that is to be the case where a team is going to build that around him. If he does end up falling to round two, based on how excited I think that the fantasy community is still going to be about him, I'm probably going to be out because then we're looking at significant risk factors because I don't imagine this is a guy who's going to have any ability to beat press coverage consistently. I don't imagine it's going to be a guy who's going to be, you know, winning contested catches or winning over the middle of the field. So I think we're kind of, uh, you know, it's going to be like Zay Flowers is a, is a guy who comes to mind immediately as a guy who he wins short to the line of scrimmage and deep and not really over the intermediate areas. And that's kind of where we need to be living with Xavier Worthy. Yeah, I like that call too, that like first round, you know, you can at least sort of rest assured that he's going to be featured. Second round, he could kind of just get forgotten. Um, and be, I don't even know, like Anthony Schwartz-ish. Um, after yeah. that, we have the 12 spot. Uh, this one, I'll go with his teammate. I'll go A.D. Mitchell. I'm honestly not that stoked about A.D. Mitchell. Um, he looks good. Uh, he kind of has some swagger like to him. I like Mitchell more. Uh, <laughs> this guy. Um, but A.D. Mitchell murdered the combine. He ran like a four. Not even. <laughs> he read uh, 435 uh, at 205 pounds. He's sick. Uh, the only thing that like kind of throws me off is like I don't think he ever had a thousand receiving yards. He never really dominated a season. He kind no. of gives me George Pickens vibes, but like without the like brutal leg injury and without like the you know wearing the shiesty, watching himself getting drafted kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, Ad Mitchell's fun. Like the the biggest thing that I have an issue with is I'm trying to pull it up here. Uh, 
80 Mitchell's eight uh yeah, it's like it's like fifteen point six, like three yards up to catch per reception. So like you're operating in like George Pickens, Cortland Sutton, DJ Char sort of area of like just being downfield. Maybe he develops. I've I've heard C D Lamb comps, which to me like they don't really add up. <clears throat> um so that's where Matt on AD Mitchell. Are you like are you excited? Did the combine do anything for you with AD Mitchell? Yeah, it, it made me excited that um I want people that I don't want to draft. So I'm I'm really excited uh about AD Mitchell. Uh I, I don't like look, I'm not thinking he has like some horrible profile that he can't hit. But of all of the guys in this tier of players, this morass of players, he's probably the one that I fear missing out on the least. Um, just in the sense that, you know, there's no production there really at all. Not There's none at Georgia. I know we got our, there wasn't that much at Texas. I know we played with good teammates. But there's other players still available to me that I don't feel like I have to make a lot of excuses for. And I do feel like I have to make excuses for him. And, you know, it gets scarier. Let's say he goes round one and he's a chief or he's a bill. And now all of a sudden my fear of missing out meter goes higher. But I, I, I just, I would, I would be surprised. I guess if this is a guy, where when you really need to start applying the excuses and you need to start squinting for the profile to look better and manipulating it to make the profile better, like, could this guy be good? Sure. Is this really the guy that's going to be a superstar? You know, when he, when he couldn't ever beat out his teammate to college, it, it's just not as likely. So uh, he's a guy that I'm generally going to be probably fading in this class. Unless he gets one of those elite landing spots, and then I'll be uncomfortable with the price, but I'll probably want to at least mix in a couple as a just in case type of situation. Yeah, I, I get that. I would say too with the combine, like Xavier Worthy, I think that he boosted his odds to go first round um, as totally. well. Now you are up here, uh, first pick of the second round. What do you got? Yeah. Um, well, I'm gonna. Hmm, I'm a little torn here. I think there's still one receiver left here that has a really nice clean profile that I'm going to take, um, you know, and maybe we're in a post analytics world, but there's a lot of prospects here where the draft capital is a lot better projected than the analytical profile is, but there's still a guy here that is an early declare two years of production, early breakout wins down the field. You know, what more do you want? So I know he's a skinny little guy, but I'm going to take Troy Franklin here um, and and see what happens with that. I think Troy Franklin is your, uh, I think you got to update that tweet of like, it didn't work for these wide receivers, Elijah Moore, KJ Hamler, Marvin Mims. He's I think that, that, I think after, I mean, I'm trying to, none of them are that tall either now that I'm looking at the list, but you know, like skinny analytic darlings that are going to go second round and like maybe just fall off the face of the earth. I like Troy Franklin too. Um, you think he's but, not? You think he has no chance of going in the first? Dude, I'm. I I don't think so. Maybe, right. may, dude. I think people are gonna. I know it doesn't really matter, but I think the the scouts. He 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 dropped an egg at the combine. Like I, he ran a four four, but holy shit, that got ga- that gauntlet was crazy. He did you see him run the gauntlet? Yeah, people didn't like the gauntlet. Yeah, I know people didn't like the gauntlet. <laughs> He bobbed and he's, weaved or whatever. He's weaving all the way around. There's nothing that these Twitter film people love more than like, like oh, my, oh, look at him. There's the line. There's the 40-yard the line. Oh, he's moving off the line on the gauntlet. Oh, my God. But I'm telling yeah. you, there's some scout up up in the rafters at, uh, at Lucas Oil just chewing his gum and just third rounder, not taking him. I don't know. There there's is something with Troy Franklin. more annoying to me than than iron hitting because I remember all these tweets from these like film people that aggravate me about Kyron after he ran like like the type of 40 yard dash that me and you might run yeah and then apparently everybody's like you know yeah he got disappointed with the combine but any real scout isn't worried about times they're worried about the drills and he looks smooth and then when he went round five, I was just like so excited to like dunk on all these people who were just like, what really matters is the <laughs> drills. Like, newsflash, he brought, lost like three rounds of draft capital off that 40 time. And, sh- and sure enough, the problem was they didn't listen to the, to the guys, their big league chew up in the stands focusing on the drills because they should have ignored the 40 time. <laughs> they're, they're, they're the, the big league chew guys were right and the Jonah Hills were wrong. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, Fra- Franklin, like he's good. It, it seems like too good. It seems like a, it feels like an analytics trap. I don't know. It feels like we've been doing this for a while. He feels like one that we all really like. He's the one to me, like like you said, like he's not as tiny as the other ones, but he's the one to me that I don't know that the NFL likes nearly as much as we do. We'll see. I know sure. some guys do gush about him where they like almost throw out like Devontae Smith type comp. So we'll truly see. I still like him. And I think uh, as much as I'm like kind of apprehensive, I think I have him ranked like literally right here um, where you would be taking him. I, I just I'm not all that excited, but I will say if he goes like second round and say like A.D. Mitchell goes like first to the Chiefs and we can scoop up early second Troy Franklin, I'd be fine with that. I'm just not stoked about it now this next pick dude the more the more that i think about it the more that i, I want to put i want to keep putting this guy higher um it's keon coleman dude keon coleman i actually i'm really starting to like i know that like nobody likes him it seems like everybody's out on him i think the nfl likes him i think the nfl will take him in the late second we'll see how that happens i know he runs a four six and like everyone's like oh my god he had a terrible combine Relative athletic score was still 9.23, 38 inch vertical, 6'3, 213 pounds. He returned punts, had the fastest miles per hour in the gauntlet drill. I know that you care very much and very deeply about that drill. But, dude, but he that's did all seem, that to me is the gauntlet. He drill. was like arrogant. Like he, like, you know, Troy Franklin's like kind of like bracing for the ball and like Keon Cullen's going through the drills looking very clean, very, you know, he just looks very confident in his game. I do love the, the fact that he played uh, basketball, Michigan State. He kind of, to me, feels like a, a discount uh, Drake London, but like a, like, I don't know if if Drake London was like a lottery, like almost like a, a mystery box on Black Ops, and it's like it could be Drake London, but it could also be Doriel Green Beckham, you know. Um, <laughs> but is sick. You got I, I, Drake London. You got <laughs> Doriel Green Beckham. Come on. Or he could be a, he could be a Ray Gun. He is he's sick. He does have the contested target percentage issue, where twenty six percent of his targets were contested. That's in like the Nikhil Harry Quan Johnston zone. But it's also in the T. Higgins, like Jamar Chase, like not that far out. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But he does seem like a, a very fluid athlete. Again, the pun returns. I like the drip as well. Like sometimes at the Florida State games, he's wearing like two mouthpieces, like a leg sleeve going. I like it. Really young, too. He's like he's going to be him and Malik Neighbors are the only two wide receivers that will be 20 years old on draft day. So I like Keon Coleman. I know that he's not everybody's cup of tea. But if you give me him in the second round, I'm going to have a lot of Keon Coleman. Um, I'm curious where you're going with this. Is 203. this like, is this- are you for what? At this what? point in time, like, do you feel like you're getting a discount on Keon Coleman, or are you now just looking to trigger the nerds? Like, is like is is your basis? How much of your basis for liking Keon Coleman is how much everyone else hates Keon Coleman? No, it's the basis that it's, it's a good value. Era. It's a good value. Hold on, hold on, Keon Coleman. If you look are back, you just at, like, like, are you just like actually like too many people are into radio ad? <laughs> That's not what this is. I promise, dude. This is this is coming from someone where, like, I'm trying to remember, it was the Brandon Ayuk draft class, where, like, right before that, like, you know, like, Bean Counter came over the top, we became obsessed with, like, wide receiver size, where we were like, you know, if you just simply took T. Higgins, Brandon Ayuk in that class, and not, like, your Kadarius, or no, Kadarius Tony wasn't even in that class, but, like, Ayuk, T. Higgins, he's, like, big wide receivers that have, like, a tough profile, but a lot of times they have that upside. Keon Coleman kind of presents that to me, and, like, after Brian Thomas Jr., I guess, like, to me, like, Xavier Worthy, Troy Franklin are, like, these skinnier guys, and, like, yes, the NFL is going that way. But Keon Coleman is kind of the archetype of wide receiver I've always liked. Uh, and it's been to my detriment, right? Like Quentin Johnston, Traylon Burks, like these, you know, in a better scenario, like A.J. Brown, Debo, these like big wide receivers. And we're getting a discount on that, right? You know what I mean? Like, like we've had to take Traylon Burks in the first, first round before. We've had to take Quentin Johnston in the first round. To me, Keon Coleman isn't all that far off from those guys. And we're getting him in the second round as like wide receiver eight. Um, so that is really it. Uh, I do. I like like the production's okay. The profile is there. It seems like it just seems like it's a, a massive upside swing, just with like the way that he looks, the the way he can kind of translate to be. He's also so young. Um. So yeah, I, I'm telling you, I like Keon Coleman. It's not just I'm not trying to be a hipster. All right, hipster Keon Coleman goes two two. Uh, I will take. Well, I could dip into the running backs here, but to me, there's still one more wide receiver that I actually quite care about. Uh, before that really thins out. And that's Lad McConkey. Uh, wow. Who's the opposite of Keon Coleman. Uh, you know, Ron trying to be hipster alpha. I'm just a beta. You know, I'm taking, taking my Xavier Worthies. I'm taking my Troy Franklins. I'm taking my Lad McConkeys. Um, I love Lad McConkey in the modern NFL. I think he is exactly the type of archetype of receiver you want beat the cover two shell. 
where he's going to be a guy that is fast enough and crafty enough to win as a flanker, but it's going to play the slot with three wide receiver sets. And I understand that the overall production profile isn't there, but yards per route run substantially higher than his yards per team pass attempt. Just kind of wound up in a spot with Georgia where he's dealing with some injuries. They're kind of weird. They blow a lot of teams out. Test super athletically. I mean, you want to talk about a guy who was smooth through the gauntlet. I mean, you got to watch Lab McCon. Oh, yeah. Yes. Roll through the gauntlet like a knife through butter. Uh, I, I, I legitimately think this guy can play. And I don't think he's just a meme. I think the NFL also thinks this guy can play. I think he's going to be drafted late one, round one or early <clears> round <throat> two. And especially if you get this guy to, you know, one of those elite high volume passing offenses at the end of round one, uh, or maybe he goes to the Chargers early in round two. That's the dream for him. This is a guy who can just rack up a high volume of targets, be a consistent guy in your lineup week in, week out. You know, maybe this is a guy that has that sort of Amon Ross St. Brown type of deployment where we're getting high target volume, high volume slot targets, high after the catch opportunities that has just enough juice where he's able to stay out there in uh, two wide receiver sets. I, I, I'm plan- if I'm going to go against sort of the data profile that we typically like, uh, maybe, maybe I'm not as much into Keon Coleman, but I'm very into Lab McConkey. Yeah, and I, I think, like like I said, kind of the big theme has been, you know, like learning from past mistakes of the analyst community. I don't, I mean, 2020 me would want to vomit at the idea of 203 Lad McConkey. Um, but like in my rankings right now, I have him wide receiver nine as my 15th ranked player. Like I'm right with you. I do think he's going to get the draft capital. I think the numbers are unkind for him. I think he has some valid excuses. The athleticism, like also if you went out there and he tested like, you know, like pedestrian, like, you know, whatever white wide receiver you want to name, but he has a relative athletic score. Like they pump out comps. He's comparable to Garrett Wilson, four, three, nine speed, 186 yeah. pounds, five eleven. like he blah, blah, blew the blah, doors blah. off, man. Um, so I like him. He does seem like one of these guys where I, I maybe slept on him in the past with, um, you know, Jordan Addison and guys who are just like very clear separators in college where they had a trump card like Devontae Smith. It were, seems like were you, so- part, were you part of the QJ over uh, over Addison contingent? I was. I was, yeah, Jacob. Ha. Yeah, Hot I seat. was. But now we have Keon Hot Coleman seat. at 202. So I can uh, I'm going to get my get back with Keon Coleman um, yeah. with those archetypes. But enough of that. Uh, I'm going to take I'm probably going to take your guy here. Um. I think it's probably running back time. Yeah, it's going to be running back time. I'm going to take Trey Bun- Benson. Uh, uh, I know, I know yeah. that you know you've been you've been uh, calling out his name for a long time here. He's fun. Uh, he went out and tested really well at the combine. I think he ran in the four threes, which was like pretty yeah, exciting. Four three nine, baby. Four three nine kind of gives me. No, uh, I don't watch running back. I'm not. I'm not like Jacob, where I'm sitting here with like you know I got the projector on and I'm I'm with the the yellow page notepad writing down notes for these running backs but trey benson uh on paper at least kind of Brees hall in a way or like Brees hall if you remember like pre-combine like no one thought he was gonna run four three nine like it was like can he break four five i never got vibes that like anyone's expecting a four three nine from trey benson but he runs 216 pounds four three nine he's just an absolute monster like what do you when you see him uh play and stuff it seems like he wasn't like a bell cow for florida state like he was kind of like, I don't know if he ever had, like, more than, like, 1,200 rushing yards in a season. I could be wrong, but uh, what, do you, what do you see when you see Trey Benson? Well, first of all, uh, if you want to hear a lot more about Trey Benson, I just recorded an hour-long podcast with uh, Dynasty Zoltan that'll be out on March 11th, exclusively about Trey Benson. So that, that's Hell a yeah. Trey Benson deep dive. Uh, he had my RB1 in the class. He had my RB1 in the class pre-combine. Um, I'd like it noted. I was on stream with, with Liam. We did our breakdown of the rookie class prior to the combine. And my bold prediction was we would get a sub 4-4 four four from him at 215 plus. So we did. Our, our speed score king got it done for us. Thank you, Trey. I think with him, it's a matter of, you know, this is a running back class to me that has a lot of solid players, but that lacks a ceiling uh, really cl- almost across the board in this running back class where you have guys that, either look like potential satellite backs or you know, slasher backs, but or guys that I think can be bruisers but don't really have the athletic juice. And Benson, his weaknesses to me are maybe a little bit more fixable and more concerned with his floor than his ceiling. I think he struggles with decision-making and vision consistently behind the line of scrimmage. And 
you know, we have questions about his ability to handle volume because he was more of a lead back in a timeshare uh, under Mike Norvell at Florida State. But what we can't doubt is he has the requisite size. He has the requisite athleticism. He has shown at least a sufficient ability in the receiving game. And what's really fun about him is he's an absolute home run hitter. To me, the speed not only pops on tape, but he has an ability to use it. I think he's a really intuitive runner when he gets out into space where he's one of those guys where instead of just breaking down and trying to juke the defender directly in front of him or breaking a tackle, he's able to stay at full speed as he's maneuvering through the open field. And so he break, you know, gets past one guy, the next guy isn't there to get him. He's a guy who ranks near the top of the class in missed tackles, fourth percentage, and performs you know, in the top quartile in yards after contact and an explosive rate. But what's really fascinating is how high he ranks in terms of the percentage of his rushing yards that come on explosive plays. Uh, that's over 53% of his rush yards. That's fifth in the entire class out of 86 eligible running backs. And that's because when he gets his 20-yard run, he's not stopping. He's taking it all the way to the house. And I think what's interesting with him is once he's actually on the move and he's in the field of the play, you know, he gave this answer at the combine. They asked about him in the open field. He said, I just run. And I think that that kind of describes his strengths and his weaknesses, which is that, yeah, behind the line of scrimmage, he just runs. And sometimes hmm. it's into his lineman or sometimes it's into a tackler and sometimes he's missing cutback lanes or cutting back from half to. But once he gets in motion and he's committed himself, he actually navigates rushing lanes very well. He gets skinny to the hole. He runs with strong rhythm. He doesn't put himself into harm's way uh, in an out-of-control fashion. He understands how to run with a convoy of blockers and paces runs out. I think he's going to be a weapon in the screen game. I think if he gets into a zone running scheme where he's able to move laterally and not have to choose his gaps when he's starting his runs, I think he could be a smash. Uh, and I'm really, really excited to see how his career goes. Uh, my hope is that he lands on you know one of those high-octane offenses in his own running scheme, Houston would be the absolute dream for him, I think. Uh, I think he's got the highest ceiling of any running back in the class and should be taken as the RB1. Now, with Trey Benson, I agree with everything you just said. Um, I did just spend all day building on my running back database, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay on you some, some goodness here. My entire – so this is dating back to 2016. Uh, missed tackles force per a touch, career numbers. He is the second best. First best is Antonio Gibson, but, you know, he had, like, maybe 40 running back carries. Uh, Trey Benson, uh, honestly, 39%. Kind, kind of a similar player. Uh, yeah? Not gonna lie. Yeah, I think, Benson. That they, I think that they have some similarities in terms of like an explosive, talented running back needs some refining. Always have the uh, finger on the right trigger. Um, yeah, exactly. But it's Trey Benson, then it's Javante, then it's Bijan for guys who cleared 38% missed tackles force per touch. And then elusiveness rating. He rang, he's 155.1, which is just behind Antonio Gibson, Dwayne McBride, and Darwin Thompson. We won't talk about them. Bijan Robinson, Javante Williams, Ty J. Spears, Trey Benson. So pretty, pretty cool list. And then in terms of like the 2020 class, he's third in uh, runs that go over 15% or over 15 yards. So he's explosive. He's big. He's also a young senior where he's not an early declarer, but he's 21 years old. So all really, really nice for Trey Benson. What do you got at 205? And I'll note really quickly, too, people are wondering why didn't he do anything before Florida State. Um, he had just an unbelievable leg injury in his freshman year uh, where he tore his ACL, his MCL, his PCL, his meniscus, and his hamstring, I believe. That's um, awful. I, I might have missed one or overstated one, but it was like four to five different ligaments plus his hamstring. Um, so that basically wiped out really the first two years of his college career. He ends up transferring from Oregon to Florida State. I have no concerns about the late breakout. Based on that, the, the one concern to me in his profile outside of the film critiques is just that he never got above 156 carries a season. Um, I'm going to stick at the running back position. I'll take the other, I think, tier one running back in this class. I think he would be very, very close to me with Benson for RB1 in this class and might even be my RB1 in this class if he was fully healthy. Uh, and that's Jonathan Brooks. Uh, he has... Six feet tall. He is a fake 216 pounds <laughs> um, after showing up to the combine, not with any expectations. He drills, of course. Uh, he's just three months post operation right now. And he's probably the guy who might be the, the most of a total package in this class in terms of having, at least on the borderline of the requisite size, to be that bell cow runner. Also, very smooth in the receiving game. I think a little bit more of a developed tree. Dan, we were just mentioning with Trey Benson. 
And my only concern with him is just, I, first of all, I don't believe the 216. I think he runs pretty upright. I think he's a little bit slender. And I'm not super convinced as to what he's going to be able to provide for you as a goal line or short yardage running back. But strong in the receiving game, strong vision. You'll watch him and he has that like gliding style, which is, you know, think of like a, um, you know, a peak Tony Pollard, an Aaron Jones, even a Jameer Gibbs, those running backs who, when they're kind of running to the edge, it doesn't even look like they're moving very quickly. But they're able to continually set up the right angles. That's really the style you're going to get when you see uh, Jonathan Brooks. And it's, it's something that appeals to me for sure. I, I think he has the best contact balance of, of any of the running backs that I've watched in the class. I think he has the record of speed. Uh, I think he has strong vision. He's really a complete package. I don't see any massive weakness in his game, maybe outside of the goal line. I wanted to ask, you know, with like you're thinking about thinking Substack and how you kind of look at things from like a very meta, like zoomed out perspective, how do you kind of wrestle with the idea of drafting a running back coming off an ACL tear when like the running backs we draft in Dynasty, we want production, right? So he, he kind of presents yeah. like a very weird uh, like asset where you're like drafting a guy that like maybe you're not really expecting to be a producer until year two, but it's like running backs are fragile. So kind of like how are you weighing that with like where you'd be okay drafting Brooks? Well, I like where he goes here, 205, that's for sure. Um, I think generally speaking, the market to me is too optimistic about him. I, I, he's going, you know, right near the middle of best ball drafts. Um, I'll just say I'd be surprised if he ends up going at the 205 in a lot of our drafts once we actually do this for real. And I think, to me, I'm fine with him here because we're kind of past the slate of receivers that I think are actually pretty legit. I think we're into firmly question mark territory at receiver. We're going to be firmly into question mark territory at running back. You know, so at this point, we're taking a shot on upside, and I don't mind doing that with an injured player. But it is notable to me that, like, you know, there's contingents of this class who will hold Trey Benson's late breakout against him because he tore an ACL. People will hold Blake Corn's 2023 efficiency against him when he was coming back from a massive knee injury. And yet, people are more than happy to sign up for their ACL injury that will actually affect them when they actually have this guy on their team, right? You know, it's funny. We go one year away from, hey, Brees Hall uh, just <laughs> tore his ACL. You can't draft him. You know, this guy who was a super star prospect everything you could possibly want one of the best running backs in the nfl as a rookie you can't draft him you know until the fifth round or the sixth round but you know make sure that you now after we've seen this one example nobody cares about it right we have to be thinking about it probabilistically from all angles we can never be too optimistic or too pessimistic about something like this we try and make sure that we're taking everything into account and notably Unlike Brees Hall, Jonathan Brooks is a good, not great prospect. He's more of a B plus, A minus prospect. And we have an actually seen play in the NFL, right? He could be a scrub for all that we know. So I like Brooks, but I am reticent to chase him up into the first round or something if he gets a really good landing spot because I, I am legitimately concerned that we're probably not going to see a very effective Jonathan Brooks this year. Odds are. Yeah, I agree. I'm in the same boat. I, I think that I think you're right. Like this is a good spot, but I, I doubt in the most of our leagues we're gonna be able to get him at you know like mid second, assuming he does get a nice landing spot. Um, yeah. It it's just like very weird for me because it's like if I draft a running back, I'm probably competing. So then it's just like I don't know. You're kind of like chasing right. your own tail. Um, but at a certain point, you do have to press the button on a Jonathan Brooks because his profile is nice. I kind of wish with the ACL that he went back to Texas, but it's not like it really would have mattered. Um, next up here. I believe this is my pick. Uh, we're going to scroll the F down and take Jalen Wright, wherever he may be. Um, I don't, I like Jalen Wright. I know that you love him. I know a lot of people love him. Uh, shout out Lance Zierlein. Well, that's probably a strong word for me. I felt like I liked him. I, like, I put out a tweet when he was going like ADP 210 and underdog, and I was yeah. like, that doesn't make any sense. This guy's pretty good. And then it was like, fast forward a week, and I had a bunch of people on my timeline seeing the RB2 in the class, and I was like, well, that's a little far for me. Um, so maybe I'm maybe I'm more in the middle on Jalen Wright, but go Falls. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, Lane Zierlein, who we all know, he his running back grades are like his best grades. He has Jalen Wright as his RB two, and he actually had him as his RB two yeah. before the combine. So, um, respect to him. I don't know, like he tested really well, right? Like he ran fast and everything. That's really all I'm looking for. Maybe he gets a fun landing spot. Uh, I'm trying to look through with the numbers I sort of put together. Uh. Runs of 10 plus yards, 9.4% is like pretty high in this class. But outside of that, it doesn't look like he really yeah. caught a ton of passes or took on a lot of volume. 
I'm just kind of praying for day two draft capital uh, for an explosive back who, what did he, what did he come in at? He came in at like six, <clears> what <throat> was he, 208, something like that? Two, two, five, ten and a half, 210 pounds, four, three, eight, 40 yard dash, explosive with 38 vertical jump. So uh, he's, he's fun. He tested well. Uh, and like the the other guys in this range are all kind of murky. We're getting into a kind of a nasty yeah. spot here. Do you have any uh, anything to add on Jalen Wright? Yeah, I like Wright. I mean, I think we've seen this type of back come into the league before, especially recently. Um, I've watched him a lot. Like for people who don't know, I'm a Tennessee fan. Um, so I, I've watched almost I've watched probably at least half his games over the last couple of years. And again on on the All Twenty Two, um, got a ton of juice. I, I don't think he has a lot of power behind the line of scrimmage. I, I've seen some people. You know, sort of cite how he finishes his runs as an ex- as an example of the power that he has. I agree. I think he finishes runs strong. I don't think he has much power right when he ha- when he gets the ball. So I think he's not a goal line running back at, at all to me. And I think he will struggle against loaded boxes. People haven't watched the Tennessee offense. It's not like anything else. You'll see they go four wide on every single play. They space the field out dramatically. So basically, what you're looking at every time he gets behind the ball is it's, it's a zone read run. With five offensive linemen, no tight ends, no fullbacks, nothing like that, and usually five to six men in the box. And so it's usually a matter of, do the five guys block their five guys? Yes. Then he's sprinting through the hole for 20 yards. No. Then he's tackled for a three-yard loss. Um, and so to me, he's kind of in this like Miles Sanders, free bulk up Ronald Jones, Jerome Ford like world of probably going to be in the low 30s in success rate probably going to make up for it with explosive plays i think he's a guy that is best getting you know 12 to 14 carries per game i think he's a willing pass protector i think he has okay hands i don't think he's more than a screen swing pass guy i don't think he's like a developed receiving game so i think he's fine i like him more in best ball because i can see him easily fitting into like a slasher role um it would be it would be surprising to me if an nfl team entrusted him as an all situation belt that makes sense. Uh, I'm curious where you're at here. I mean, like, there's, I mean, this is kind of where it flattens out, where, like, I could think you could almost say, like, the early third, like, you're getting similar tier of players uh, as you are here, but I'm curious where you're going, like, wide receiver, tight end, running back, what are we thinking? Yeah, this is a top one, and I'm going to stay on the running back train maybe for one more pick. Um, I'll take my third favorite running back in the class, and I, he's kind of boring, and he's not, you know, maybe he doesn't have the highest ceiling either because of our concerns with his you know, athleticism, some concerns with his pass catching. But I just think he's really good at football. So I'll take Blake Corum here. I like that pick, man. Like, Blake Corum, he's, again, someone I think in the past I wouldn't have really liked, but I watched a good amount of college football this year. Like, Blake Corum is good. He's good at football. Yeah. Um, I, I think I cashed, like, a really fun parlay with him, too. I think I had, like, him. Dude, every game. He was a lock to score a touchdown. Like he, I, I would bet him like two plus touchdowns oh, totally. and like Michigan to win by like fourteen. Um, at like an alternate spread and got like a, a nice little parlay with him. He's fun, dude. I mean, like he's always hitting the the hole. I was on Bama. I'm trying to think of. I think it was in the overtime where he just like completely uh gashed Bama. Like I want to say it was uh some kind of like stretch zone or or something, but he he just took it up. Oh, Went yeah, I remember the that. house like yeah. in the overtime where it was like it just completely took the winds out of the sails of Alabama. Bama gets the ball back, does the weird like fumble the snap jet motion thing. Uh, I think that that was the Rose Bowl, right? But yeah, um, absolutely. Corm's an absolute he's... monster. I don't know what his ceiling looks like in the NFL, but he I am fairly uh, certain that he's like Brian Robinson. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good comp. Do we think that he catches passes? I think that it's possible that he catches passes like. He he actually had over 20 receptions, I believe, as a freshman. Um, I, I don't have that in front of me, and it's possible that I'm talking out of my ass, but I, I, I want to say that that's true. I'll pull that up to actually confirm. Um, but then, of course, he plays the rest of his college career with Donovan Edwards, and mm-hmm. Donovan Edwards is just a better pass catcher. Oh, yeah, sorry, he's a sophomore. He has 24 receptions. Um, not as a freshman. Donovan Edwards, superior pass catching running back. Um, no question about that. He's not a very dynamic running back in space, so I don't see teams wanting to scheme him in there but oh he's a willing pass protector i think uh he doesn't have to do it a lot but i think cerebral running back you know is gonna have the ability to do that role if necessary i don't know i, I still think you're looking more like an alfred morris feeling with like a jordan howard to brian robinson type floor 
I mean, the one thing that I'll say though is if he is going to be that, you'd prefer he not be 5'8, 207. Um, and so then you're kind of looking at, okay, is he Kyron Williams without the receiving? And that's, you know, it gets less fun. But at the 207, he's probably one of the last guys remaining that I feel really confident is a good football player and, you know, knows what he's doing when he ever gets the ball in his hands. And that's just kind of what I'm trusting at this point. Yeah, relative athletic score in terms of the comps that they spit out, one that sticks out is Bobby Rainey. Uh, five seven two oh five running a four five forty. Bobby um, Brady. Bobby wow. Brady, yeah. man. But like you can kind of yeah, talk yourself a into guy, like right. He like a Florida guy in like the glory days of Florida. He was a Western Kentucky boy, Bobby. Is he Rainey. Western Kentucky? I must get him. I must be getting can can confused with someone. Anyway, but you got a lot Rainey. of smaller that running name? backs. Uh, uh, what? A Florida running back. No, I just I remember Bobby Rainey existing, but I clearly haven't con- confused it. Yeah, Bobby first. Rainey is just uh, just a name floating around in my head. I don't even really know who he is. I kind of remember him as a small guy, uh, but you can kind of talk yourself into like Devontae Freeman types. I, if Blake Corum oh, ran yeah. a four four, you could talk yourself into Maurice Jones Drew. People forget Maurice Jones Drew was like five six, like two ten, and ran like a four three yeah. nine. There you go. Um, I, I like that comp. I know it's. I know he said if he ran a four four, but I'm I'm gonna take it anyway. <laughs> but. Next pick is me. Um, I think I'm going to go with another running back, man. Like, I was looking at the receivers. I might go receivers. You could make a case that, like, there's a few wide receivers on the board that are pretty solid bets to go second round in the NFL draft. Like, at this point, we're worrying about draft capital. But I think a running back that the NFL likes a lot that I think could get drafted even ahead of some of the running backs we've already taken um, is Marshawn Lloyd. I'm going to go Marshawn Lloyd. I'm not in love yep. with Marshawn Lloyd. Um, but he tested well where he's like what like 220 pounds and ran like a four four or something. Um yeah, four four six, five nine, two twenty. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's four tough. Yeah, that's insane. Um he also is like super explosive where if we look at the 2024 numbers, yeah, he's second in this class and uh runs that went over 15 yards. Really nice 124 elusiveness rating for like his size as well. Miss tackles force per touch is great. He looks solid. I don't really know what his upside is. It seems like his receiving production's not amazing i know he was a devin devy darling as well where he was like a five-star guy coming out um he just seems like someone the nfl might sell themselves on just of like you know in my offense this guy could be a stud i'm curious have you done any of your film study with marshawn lloyd i haven't finished it i've just started it I've, I've only watched a couple of games of him he's one of the last guys on my list i'm trying to get through sort of my top 10 guys um and uh but i i'm very interested and i'm very excited to watch more of him i'm going to be doing uh, i think probably a lot of film grinding tomorrow <clears throat> And I'm pretty excited to watch a lot more of Marshawn Lloyd. And yeah, I mean, he brings a lot to the table, kind of a similar archetype to Jalen Wright in terms of like how they were deployed. But Lloyd brings you that in a bigger package. So that's potentially very exciting. Um, I like the pick. All right. Who do you got at uh, 209? Man, we're getting really into it here. Uh, oh, yeah. hmm. I guess at this point in time, I'll just hope for draft capital and a guy really zooming up the board. And so I'll take Michael Penix, uh, also known as Michael Penis. And wow. I think he's bad, but uh, he's a quarterback and maybe a team will take him early round two. I also don't even think that's going to happen. I think he's going to go in round three. I think he's going to be a backup for life. Like, and I think he's like a Taylor Heineke type. I don't have anything good to say about this guy, but I don't have much good to say about anybody at this point. And if some team decides to take him in round two, then I promise you, he will not be going at the 209 uh, come the time you actually do your draft. So I'll, I'll take my little penis and I'll hope for the best. I agree. And I think what's crazy, man, is just, I, I, you know, like it's smokescreen season or whatever. I really do think that he's live to go first round of the NFL draft. And obviously I haven't picked him yet, so I don't really uh, like him much. But I do think the NFL might like him a ton. I heard at the combine that his medicals and like his ACL tear didn't come back as bad as expected. Yeah, um, that's good. I think pretty much what people really like is like again the on field drills. I think he just looked like the best passer there. Um, like between him, Nick's uh, McCarthy or whatever, he has like a oh, Joe Milton arm, but dude. he's not bad at the game of football. Also, ten and a half inch hands. I think that's like the largest in my database. I don't know if that really does anything big for you. Um, you know what they say about mixed... big hands? <laughs> uh, big go balls is what I've heard. Um, but yeah, I, I get it. Mobile quarterback, like he's old as hell. I don't know. Like he he could be he he could be Carson Strong. <laughs> like that's kind of the issue with him. Um, but yeah, yeah Penix... that's that's my issue. He has the mobility of a fire hydrant, 
And yeah. I don't think, get sacked, I think his though. Deep passing ability is a little bit overstated. Like, I think that he just passed deep a lot because that was how their offense was set up. They had excellent receivers. I, I don't know that I think he's a particularly consistent deep ball thrower. I, I think he actually kind of struggles with the back of receive. And I don't think he is very as consistent ball placement at all. Um, and, you know, old prospect, six years starter, tough medical history. To me, he's like the quintessential high level NFL backup. Like he's the guy that you're like, okay, like, yeah, he'll chuck it around and he'll get the ball into the playmaker's hands and give the offense a spurt. And, you know, he's that guy that for two weeks, fans are like, oh, is he the answer? Right. Hmm. Like to me, he's just like the classic, like Case Keenum, Gardner Minshew, Taylor Heineke, like, let it up in college, but just doesn't really have it all together to be an NFL quarterback. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's not. Oh, just know that if he's if he's a Jet and Rodgers, you know, God forbid, goes down in like week nine, Penix comes in, throws for like 215 yards and two touchdowns with a pick. I'm all the way back in uh, on Michael Penix. But uh, I will say, like, what do you well, think of a nickname for him? Like, because like the, the like, should we should we call him Mikey Dix or like what what what's the situation with this? I don't know. What, man. what do we do with this? I Phoenix was literally saying, situation. I was literally saying Phoenix uh, when I was like doing streams during the season. I didn't know how to say his last name. I don't know, dude. Like you could say, you could call him Big Dick Nicks. Um, Big Dick Nicks. But that's, but then we got, but we already have Big Dick Nicks in this. I know, class. but he's the second coming. He's the second coming. Uh, yeah. I was like, oh yeah, you were saying deep accuracy. I wanted to make the point that in the national championship game, he missed uh, Roma Dunze like wide Every open throw. on the, like. No, that's a Dunze's fault. That was, that was a Dunze's fault. Really, I, I I kind of was in that camp and got flamed for it on Twitter, um, because it seemed like Penix was just trying to, you know, he was already open. There's no reason to like run the exact route to a tier or no, maybe I think I think Odunze was trying to run the exact route, whereas Penix was just trying to throw him open. Um, but regardless, two ten here. No, I think it was the opposite. I I think really to me. Oh, I think you're right. To, yeah, to me, he's like he has a, he has a flag on on that. To me, versus a. Uh, whatever it was, I, I forget. I'm forgetting the specifics of the play. I want to say it was a cover three look, and he's against the safety, and I want to say he's breaking yeah. the flag. I could be wrong on that. On the specifics no, you're right. But, but anyway, I, I remember litigating it now, and it's like up coming back to me. I remember basically a Dunze runs the route as called, and Penix just says, hey, you're open. I'm going to throw it to you kind of where you are, and then you end up having these issues. Uh, or, or, or sorry, Penix runs it where he's thinking, and a Dunze is just, I'm open, and he keeps running. Um, I don't know, miscommunication. Either way, whoever's fault it was, I don't think it was an accuracy problem. That's what I'm trying to say is that I think it was a, someone made the wrong decision, but I think that like Adunze ran where he thought he should be running and Penix threw it to where he thought he should be throwing it. They just weren't going in the same place, but I don't think he like missed them. Yeah. Brutal spot to make that error as well. Um, let's go. All right. So my next pick, I don't even like the guy, but we're going to go Xavier Leggett. I think that he is the best. We're in the, I don't even like the guy phase of the draft. That's, no, that's, that's exactly, like. that's where we, that's where we've been swimming. This at. guy um, sucks. Give him to me. <laughs> Dude, Xavier Leggett. It, it's tough, man. I think that he's the best bet to get good draft capital. I mean, he murdered the combine. He pretty much did exactly what Mingo right. did. Uh, he ran what? Like four, three, at like six, two, 220 pounds. Yeah. Six, six, one, 220 pounds, ran a four, three, nine. 40 inch vertical. I mean, he's a monster, um, but he didn't monster. break out until year five. I've read a thread. The other, someone sent me a thread on Xavier Leggett where, like, I don't know, he had like a tough time his freshman year and then COVID and then, like, just like excuse after excuse. And I get it, but like, everyone's on the same playing field. I, I It's tough for me to make an excuse for a guy his first four years. A, at least I can sell myself on like the similar thing to Keon Coleman, where he has the profile of a guy who could be sick, you know, where he's like big, he is fast, and that's cool. Um, but yeah, that's about all I got. You got anything, anything good to say about no, Xavier Leggett? Like guy, I mean, yeah, at a certain point, right? Like to me, it's like if we're if we're gonna become Xavier Leggett guys, then then we're just then 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 either we're film guys or we're nihilists. But like we've like abandoned <laughs> the analytical project if we're becoming Xavier Leggett guys. Now, I always say like at at its core, analytics is about humility, right? So. You want to be sure to be humble enough to not pick favorites and not say, I know this guy is the one who has all the good excuses and this guy is the guy that we have to throw out the models for. And at the same time, you want to always say, hey, we could always be wrong. So, you know, when we get into 210 and like it's the guy who has some chance of going fairly early in drafts, you know, of course, that's that's where it's a totally reasonable place to play to uh 
to draft a, a Xavier Leggett. But yeah, am I a fan of this guy? No, we're not. Yeah, exactly. At this point, we do have to just kind of submit to draft capital and say, hey, he's going to get drafted highly. We'll take a swing on him. I'm curious. I mean, we're getting to the very bitter end. This is your last pick, I believe. Who do you got? To Are you in only off? two rounds? All right, good. <laughs> I was gonna, I saw the four rounds there, and I was a little bit scared because I was I'm, I got a Celtics Nuggets game to watch here at some point. <laughs> like we're gonna go forty eight picks deep here. In I was a little March. afraid. I was gonna say we're just gonna be just naming names. We're not giving explanations. Let's get to round four. But who do you got? Okay, two eleven. This is my last pick. Yeah, let me hey? show you the players. Yep. Yeah. I'll do a little Good honorable call. mention afterwards, but I'll do one honorable mention afterwards, and this will be my conventional pick. Then I'll take Jadavian Sanders, uh, the second okay. tight end in this class. You know, classic move tight end, reasonable production profile. Does it nix two potential round one NFL players in Texas, Xavier Worthy and Ad Mitchell? Uh, yeah, I think you know it's nowhere close to what Bowers is. But I'm going to recycle all the talking points that we used about Pat Fryermuth during the Kyle Pitts draft, which was. Brock Bowers wasn't in this draft. Everybody would be talking about Jatavian Sanders. Uh, and, you know, I don't know how true that is, but I think it's true to an extent. I think he is like a legitimately intriguing tight end prospect that's flown under the radar. I don't know that he's on the level of the top three tight end prospects from last year's class, but I think certainly like I think a step above like a Luke Musgrave as a prospect like that. Yeah, I agree. I am curious, though, like my initial take uh during the combine was like, holy shit, like JT Sanders ran like a four six. Like, is he now Brevin Jordan or like Jalen Weidemeyer? But it seems like he kind of, I'm struggling four to find the exact. Is fine. Yeah, but uh, I know a lot of guys were hoping for sub four six with JT Sanders, but I'm not saying it's a death sentence. I'm just curious, like, uh, damn, like RES doesn't have his stuff up, but six three two forty five ran a four six something. Uh, oh, four not six too nine. Concerning. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, four six it's nine. It's not ideal. Yeah, I mean a four six nine at two forty five isn't really what we want to see. Um, you know, the typical cutoff threshold at tight end historically has been four seven. But uh, you know, that's that that's like usually the guys who are hitting in the high four sixes, four seven range are usually bigger boys. Um, make your TJ Hawkinson, your your Travis Kelsey are kind of standing out in that range. So it's not great, but I'm still trusting that, you know, the profile of a guy who as production, early breakout, early production in a crowded wide receiver room, you know, supposedly is likely to go in on day two. Um, I still think that's a profile we're, we're giving a shot on a tight end. But I, I do agree. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually catch the 4.69. That is stocked down for sure. I'm still fine yeah. with the 2.11, though. No. Yeah, that's where I'm at, too. Like, he still grades out fine. He, I'm just not as excited as I was. I know, um, and I love Brett Coleman and, and what he does. I know that he had, like, a hot take where he was saying, like, uh, he didn't think that Brock Bowers was quite in a tier of his own. Like he liked JT Sanders that much. Uh, I can't quite get there, um, but he yeah. does look solid. Yeah, I mean, I think Brett's great. Uh, I think some of his takes are a little are a little wild sometimes. Maybe, maybe if someone wanted to do a little name search, Brett Coleman, Gibbs, Roshan Johnson, just maybe see what pops up. <laughs> I've seen but, that. Um, but yeah. But he is great. I do love his videos. Um, oh, terrific. And terrific. And being opinionated isn't a bad thing when you know, no, you're not, watching not. film. All the film guys are opinionated when it really comes down to it. Um, yeah, and, but, I, and I love that. You know, like it's, it's yeah, good exactly. Well, it's good that we have people that are willing to stand on business. You know, yeah, stand for something or die for nothing or whatever the hell um, that saying goes. Now, last pick here. I'm not stoked about it, uh, as has been the case this entire time uh, that we've done this second round here. But we're going to go Jalen Polk. Uh, I don't have any crazy takes on him. Uh, I just know that he was essentially like the X wide receiver in that offense, or he was like very much the uh, contested catch, boundary, you know, bigger type of guy. Uh, I don't have his exact height weight here next to me, but he seems like he profiles well. And if his production doesn't stand out uh, like the other wide receivers we've mentioned, not named Xavier Leggett, uh, like he doesn't have like a truly dominant season, but. I think it's honestly kind of like a good thing to sort of lean in and be like, okay, he was next to Roman Dunze and Jalen McMillan. He has like a pretty valid excuse that over his entire career, that was the case. Yeah, he's 6'1", 203 pounds, 4'5", speed, 37 and a half inch vertical. That's the prototypical X receiver archetype that I'm fine chasing. I think that he uh, will go day two 
as well, Jalen Polk. Do you have any thoughts on like the Washington receivers? You oh, I know, I know, uh, I actually know who your honorable mention is going to be. I, I've already decided in my head. Yeah, it's the other. Uh, Washington yeah, I receiver. have. I really like the other Washington wide receiver, uh, but I like Polk and Gresh. I know is a big Polk guy, and of course he's a massive Huskies fan, so mm-hmm. I, I take that pretty seriously. Uh, I like all the Washington guys. I think me too. I think if they're if you're going to get a hit on a late receiver in this class, I think Polk and McMillan are two good places to look because you're you're getting you know, a productive receiver next to two other productive receivers. And I would argue it's even a correlated bet, right? Like if yep. the better, the better we know the one is, then the more impressive the other's production is. So to me, I would want to be an overmarket position on both Polk and McMillan. Um, I've kind of staked a claim on McMillan as my mean sleeper guy, he's cheaper, underdog draft. He's just like literally free. You can just get this guy absolutely for free. Uh, I don't understand it. He had, you know, injury problems this past year. If you go back to their junior year, he had over 2.3 yards per route run, considerably higher than Jalen Pohl. And within 0.2 of Roma Dunze comes back this year, the raw production goes way down because once again, injured, but still has slightly higher, like literally by 0.01 higher yards per route run than Jalen Pohl. Um, Roma Dunze last field on that team. But he was, you know, the second most productive receiver of the group overall. And was almost running dead even with Roma Dunze uh, going back into the 2022 season. You know, also, again, slot receiver, but he's a slot receiver that's six feet 197. I, want, I think that might be off by a couple pounds, but essentially six feet 200. So, again, we're getting into the Amon Ra zone of like, this is the slot receiver I want, where it's a slot receiver that has the ability to stay out and block as a flanker. And he gets under 4.5, runs a 4.49 at the combine. So, this is coming together to me. Like, if I want to build my archetype of receiver in the cover two world, this is the guy to me. Come who's on. Gonna be routes and has like a really interesting prospect profile where production is a little bit better than you think because of injury and more impressive than you think because of the caliber of teammates. So, Jill McMillan is probably the biggest my guy of this uh, wide receiver class. I agree, too. It almost looks like uh, Devontae Smith and Judy at Bama, where this 2022 season, Roma Dunze had 75 for, like, 1,207. McMillan had 79 for, like, 1,109. So he was right next to him the entire way. He was similar to Corum. Uh, I was betting a ton on college football down the stretch. McMillan, uh, anytime touchdown for, like, his college football playoff run was free money every time. Um, I want to say, like, his final three games, he scored touchdowns. Joe McMillan is very fun, and I agree. He does profile like Amon Ross St. Brown, you could say it's similar to like JSN as well. Uh, it's like a discount yeah. JSN that you're gonna be able to draft in the third round. So I do love Jalen McMillan um, as well. And I'll throw I'll throw an honorable mention in there as well, just to kind of match. Um, and I'll go with Roman Wilson, man. I, I yeah. in the past, yeah, we should have drafted him. That was that was yeah, bad of us to let him. We go probably there. should have. I probably should have taken over Leggett, maybe even. Um, but Roman Wilson's really fun at Michigan, kind of similar to like your Nico Collins, where like. The offense wasn't the most like wide receiver friendly the entire time. Uh, I've even seen him in mocks go late first round. Like it, I think he's going to be a top 50 pick Roman Wilson. He yep. blocks, he plays out of the slot. He does everything. Um, he just seems like a really good football player, which I, I like at this point in the draft. I know uh, he's really good on the scramble drill as well. I remember a lot of times where like JJ McCarthy's like trying to make something happen and Roman Wilson always finds a way. Um, I'm, do you have any uh, takes on Roman Wilson? Yeah, just another guy that's going to get draft capital and is mildly interesting. And like what this exercise has taught me, it's like I really want a lot of these late second and early third yeah. round draft picks because we're still drafting players that I think are going to get legitimate draft capital and, you know, far from perfect profiles, but I think have legitimate <clears> intrigue <throat> to their profiles. And we're now at like the 302, right? And that's only with five running backs taken. And at some point in time, there's going to be other running backs who get an interesting spot that are going to be worth a look. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very excited about this draft class. I'm excited to revisit how this mock draft ages. And I think if you're, you know, if you're in Dynasty League right now, it's going to be the iron price to get one of those top seven prospects. And maybe it's going to be a struggle to go and accomplish that. But I don't think it's anywhere close to too late to be able to go and add some of these picks at the 2-9 the 210, the 32, the 34, where people ne- maybe haven't counted all out and seen, oh, I can get, you know, guys like McMillan or Polk or Wilson, uh, who are probably going to be round two picks in the NFL draft and have interesting enough profiles at a very low cost. Yeah. And we haven't even talked about like some people's pet players, like Ma- the Malachi Corleys of the world and like the Devontae yep. Walkers. 
Jake like, I think Cowlings, like a, uh, yeah, exactly. Ray, even a case that like the like I, I would almost like I, I would almost sell the two oh six for like two early thirds and like feel pretty good about it. Um or something among those lines. You know what I mean? Like I, I think I saw uh Scott Connor say it on one of his shows, but uh it popped up in my feed where he was saying like this is the class where you kind of do want the quantity because it's just it, it's I always say it every year, but this is truly a deep class where I think we're going to see record set in terms of wide receivers taken on day one or day two. Um yeah. So Really exciting stuff. Um, I appreciate you making time. It's like I don't even I don't know what time it is uh, on your half of the globe, um, but I know that you just got off of work. So I appreciate you making time. Tell people where they can find you uh, and what you got going on here this draft season. Oh yeah, man! You can find all my written work on Thinking About Thinking. Uh, we're going to be doing pretty much all rookies all March, so stay tuned for that. Um, I think I'll probably almost certainly have something out um, either this weekend or very early next week. Most of my writing is going to be coming on weekends these days with with full time work going on. So um, keep an eye out on that. Keep an eye out on Twitter, and you can keep uh, all my most my weekly audio session is all going to be on Dynasty Points on the Fantasy Points uh, Network uh, every Tuesday night. We go live, and the episode posted every Wednesday morning. All right, sweet. I'll make sure to check it out. I do. I love reading your Substack. I'm excited to get into rookies here. Really get in the weeds. Um, that's what we'll be doing on this channel. We have this rookie market. They're going to do a running back rankings video in the next couple of days. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, make sure you Love subscribe. It. Make sure you leave a like. I appreciate you coming out here, Jake. And as always, if you're watching, oh, yeah. I will see you guys in the next one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.